if you do any prospecting with LinkedIn, you have got to go get set up with Surf. That's S U R F E. It's a tool you can use to add new contacts to your CRM system directly from LinkedIn in seconds. I'm using it every single day. I add contacts, follow my deals, keep track of notes, and it ends up saving me a bunch of time on prospecting and outreach, which means I can spend more time moving my deals along. The data is always 100% accurate since I don't have to copy and paste all the fields over from each and every contact that I want to put in my CRM. Instead, Surf does that all automatically with just one click in about 60 seconds. The team over at Surf has put together a very special offer for fans of sales players. There's a link down in the show notes and you can use the promo code JWSurf5. Don't forget the E at the end of Surf. That's JWSurf5 for 5% off your first year. Don't spend another minute doing things manually. Go get set up with Surf. So if you've been a long time listener to the podcast, you've heard me tell stories about the companies where I was the first account executive hire. Uh, that's actually happened twice in my career where I was the first sales rep hired at an early stage startup company. And then I spent a bunch of my career coming into series B, uh, series A, early, early stage companies where there was either no sales reps ahead of me or I was one of the first, you know, two or three or four sales reps hired in uh, a pretty early stage startup. And recently I've been having uh, a lot of questions from fans and listeners about how to get traction if you're the first AE hire or the first SDR hire in a brand new SaaS startup. So I thought I'd put together a quick episode around some of the things that I did in those roles that really made a big impact. And I think, you know, I want to emphasize that, that really the, the job is to make a very quick and big impact when you're coming into a brand new startup company. There's, of course, not a lot of resources uh, in comparison to some of the larger software companies. You're not going to have the same type of sales stack uh, tools. You're not going to have uh, a massive list of leads. You probably aren't going to have a big team of BDRs. There's likely not a huge budget for marketing. So it can be really hard to get traction right out of the gates when you're coming into, I don't know, a room full of engineers who have built a web application or a SaaS product, and it's now time to go to market. So um, uh, bear with me here. I've got a couple of points uh, that I put together. And, it, you know, again, a lot of this is going to be subjective. It's going to be dependent on the specific company that you're at. Some companies are really trying to go down the product-led growth path, which is really focused on bringing in high volumes of users who can self, uh, you know, self-service in the, in the beginning, and then maybe they sign up for the product and grow with time. So an example of a product-led growth company might be Zoom, where you have someone who signs up for a Zoom license, and then they add their whole team, and then that team adds another team, and it sort of snowballs into this larger contract. Then you're going to have these enterprise startups that want to go out and hunt for extremely large sales. They want to close, you know, a $500,000, a million dollar annual ARR deal in their first year so that they can start to scale and reach uh, what they call escape velocity in the VC world. So uh, you're, you're going to see kind of different types. And this, some of this stuff is going to be dependent on which type of startup you're at. If you're at a more enterprise focused startup or a product led growth oriented startup. Now that said, I think all of what I'm going to talk about is applicable, even if you're not working at an early stage startup, even if you're at a big company, but maybe you're coming in and you're establishing a new territory or building a new business unit or opening up a new office or something like that. Some of this stuff is also applicable. I've found that the experience that I built working in early stage startups has also paid off in bigger companies because I've been able to come in and think in a very lean mindset and quickly determine where I can make the, the most impact as quickly as possible and deliver results as soon as possible. Because that's really, again, what it comes down to. So the first thing that I wrote down here just in, in kind of brainstorming for the few minutes before this was you got to get a deal done as soon as possible. If you're coming in as the first AE hire, or maybe you're coming in as the first SDR hire, and, and let's say that you need to set as many meetings as you can as quickly as possible. But I'm going to focus for a second on the AE because a lot of times I think what what's happening now is founders, once they've reached a certain point, and, and by the way, I'd also caution anyone out there not to join a startup too early because I think it's pretty well uh, established and, and, and pretty agreed upon in the industry that 
a startup founder should be the first salesperson in the business. That that founder or founding team needs to go and generate the first, I don't know, million, two million, five million, whatever it is. It's going to be different for every company, but they've got to go out and actually get the momentum going first before they start to come in and hire sales. What you don't want to have happen is you join a company where the founders thought that they could just outsource the sales to someone who's quote unquote, a good account executive, right? And maybe it's a technical founder and they honestly have no idea what makes a good account executive. Uh, or maybe they think because someone worked at a big company that's well known in the tech space that they're a good account executive. But the problem with that is working as an account executive at Salesforce is going to be quite different than working as an account executive at another series A or seed funded SaaS startup, right? They're two completely different muscles that you're working in those roles. Nothing against either one, of course, but you know, just because someone has a fancy logo on their resume doesn't mean that they're going to be able to come into a seed series or series A startup and make an impact. So a lot of times founders don't think about that stuff because again, they come from maybe more of a technical background or a product background and they're not thinking about what it takes to come in and build momentum as a seller in an early startup. So uh, how do you close a deal as quickly as possible? And I put here, you know, in parentheses, preferably in your first month or quarter, um, you want to put some kind of revenue up on the board somehow. You've got to get something closed as, as quickly as you can, preferably the, the first 90 days in, in the role. So how do you do that? And I'll just speak to what I did and, and what I continue to do, even in roles at bigger companies, what, what seems to work well is you've got to come in and you have to take stock of the low hanging fruit. What's low hanging fruit? Well, it's going to depend on the business, right? And I, I keep saying it depends, it depends, but you've got to come in and be able to assess the situation. So some things that you can do if you're at an early startup company and you're the first sales hire is I would immediately start assessing how much revenue the, the company has brought in up to that point. Hopefully it's well over a million in annual ARR. Uh, if that's the case, then you can start to pick the founder's brain. You know, how did you find those first, however many customers that is, is it, is it one customer? Is it seven customers? Is it a hundred customers? How did you find those? And how can we replicate some of what you were doing to bring those customers on board? And then to kind of tack onto that, I would definitely early on, if it's a very early stage, uh, startup, you want to leverage the founder's professional networks. In a lot of cases, if if someone's a, a startup founder, they've already had a pretty long career themselves. Maybe they uh, were successful at another startup that exited and they likely have a pretty big network of peers that they might be able to, to help introduce you to. So start there. Is there someone that knows the founders of the company? Do they have a Rolodex of some sort that you can start to reach out to? And you know, use, drop your, your founder's names and say, hey, look, we're, we're working with so-and-so. Uh, or I'm working for so-and-so on their, you know, series A startup and we want to talk to you about the product. Would you give us 30 minutes, right? So you can start there, go after the founder's network. That's usually the probably one of the lowest hanging fruits you can go after in an early company. Next, the, the VC's network. So are your investors involved in the business and can they start to introduce you to their personal networks, their professional networks, but also the portfolio? If you're backed by a, you know, a well-known Silicon Valley VC, then they should be able to open up their portfolio brands to, to make introductions and help you get plugged into other similar companies that might be able to buy your SaaS. Any leads is the next thing I put on here. So a lot of times when you come in really early, there's not any leads. There's not been any campaigns run yet. There's not even a CRM. In, in one case, I came into a company that didn't even have a CRM provisioned yet. There was nothing. There was maybe a spreadsheet of emails that was the founder's Rolodex and that was it. And so that was the first thing I did is I came in, started emailing connections of the founders, put their names in the, the subject line and managed to get a handful of responses from, from that campaign. But if there's no other leads, and in, in some cases, early founders maybe went to a trade show, maybe they ran a quick paid campaign before they launched the, the app. If there's something, some spreadsheet, some CRM, some database somewhere. Uh, and yeah, by the way, I, I worked for a startup where there was no CRM, but there was a database. So I, did, I had to learn how to use something called Postgres. 
which is this database technology. And that, that is where we kept all the customer and prospect data. It was a complete pain in the ass. Obviously, uh, tools like Salesforce, Outreach, HubSpot, those exist for a reason. And you shouldn't have to use Postgres or learn how to uh, understand databases in order to do your job. So that's another story. But, you know, just ask, is there any leads? Has there been any interest at this point in the company, inbound or outbound? Has there been any uh, events or shows, any webinars, any comments on the YouTube page? Whatever you can get your hands on, ask for those leads and figure out if there's any names associated uh, uh, thus far with the product or the SaaS. Did the founders, um, yeah, did the founders ever put together any kind of a list of, of target brands that they think they could sell to? And if not, work with the founders in the company to, to develop that kind of a list. They probably have a good idea as they were developing the SaaS, they probably came up with some ideas around who would be an ideal customer for that product. So it's a, it's a good exercise to get time with the founders of the company, uh, the leadership, depending on how it's structured. And if you're coming in super early, there's likely not going to be a CRO or a, a VP of sales or a seasoned sales leader above you to, to work with you on this stuff. You have to go right to the founders and work with them on, on capturing that vision, understanding who the ideal customer is and going after the, you know, again, the low hanging fruit. So I'd also recommend, you know, building out once you have an idea of who, good target accounts might be. And again, this can be just a, a conversation with the founders. I remember working in a startup where the founders just said like, hey, it'd be really cool if Bleacher Report was a customer of ours. And it would be really cool if uh, GoPro was a customer of ours. So I started to kind of look for trends. Okay, it seems like the founders think that, you know, media oriented or streaming oriented companies would be a good fit for us. How do I now build a list of, of ideal brands that fall into that? And then can I start to go and build a list of emails for targets at those accounts and then take it a neck, you know, a step further. And can, can the founders, can the founders fund an outreach license so that I can build a sequence and start to follow up in a consistent way with that list? Um, then I think, you know, in tandem with all this stuff, it's really important to build a, scalable sales process as best as you can. It's not going to be perfect, uh, especially this early on in the process. It, it's not going to look like, you know, your, your unicorn SaaS sales process. But what I mean by that is, you know, start to work with your founders. Do they already have paperwork, legal paperwork, things like a master service agreement? Do they have an order form template? Do they have a DocuSign account? So you can actually send that order form to a customer for signature. Is there a pricing proposal deck? Is there, you know, historical pricing that's been pitched to other customers? Is there pricing on the website? Do they have a process for when someone signs up or wants a proof of concept or a trial of the product? So, you know, documenting and gathering as much as you can to kind of build a sales process and, and having resources, paperwork, uh, you know, the legal paperwork, the, the, the you know, uh, signature, the, the order form, sorry, is what, is what I'm going, uh, the order form paperwork, everything that you need to execute on a deal, start to ask those questions of the founder and, and anyone else who's been there involved in sales up to that point. And a lot of times, by the way, guys, uh, these founders hire sales advisors, people that have been doing this a long time that share templates and things like that. And I know this because I'm, I'm personally, uh, I've personally been involved as an advisor in early stage startups. And I've, you know, coached and helped CEOs and founders put together the right materials so that they could, uh, you know, begin to build out this sales engine. So most likely your founders already have some, you know, some draft of these things or, or, or maybe even some, some final copies of these things. You just need to make sure you have access to them and you need to make sure that they're ready to go for when you do finally get someone who bites on the hook and is ready to, to buy. Now, it's really, really hard to sell a deal in a Series A, a seed funded, even a Series B company. Because in, in most cases, you're selling to someone uh, that's maybe never heard of your brand before. Or if they, they have heard of your brand, they're new to it. It's not uh, you know an established 10 year plus SaaS company. So they're taking a big risk. And a really interesting book is Crossing the Chasm. Highly recommend it if you're if you are going to go into an early stage startup, because uh, it kind of talks about this this curve of early adopters to um, you know 
all the way if you cross the chasm and I'm, now I'm drawing a complete blank here, but uh, I, I can post this screenshot of the, the, you know, the curve, right? So there's all kinds of different types of customers and it's really going to be your job in this role to figure out who the early adopters are. You know, I'm actually going to Google it. Let's see here. Yeah. So uh, I just pulled up this innovation model from the book. So you've got innovators is the first sort of, uh, you know, the first category and you've got early adopters and you start to go up this curve where the majority are early majority, late major, uh, late majority, and then you have the laggards. You obviously don't want to go sell to laggards. They're just not going to go and do business with an early stage startup. They want to work with established big companies that have been around for 10 years. Uh, there's a saying in SaaS that you can't get fired if you buy IBM. Uh, and you can insert, you know, Dell or I don't know, Oracle or any other product in there because those are, you know, very established legacy brands that, um, you know, have decades and decades of consistency in, in delivering results. So if you're working for a software company that just started in 2020 and you have three customers, you're not going to want to focus on any of the laggards or the late majority. You're going to want to go for the innovators and the early adopters. Now, how to find those is a little bit more tricky. And that's where really tightening up who you're going after and finding brands that can really align with your vision and are willing to experiment and try out, uh, you know, a new technology that could be transformational for them is really going to come into play. Let's see. I want to make sure I have enough time to go through the rest of the list here. So getting a deal done, uh, you in this role, if you come in as a first AE or a first SDR in a startup, you've got to learn a lot about marketing, specifically demand generation. You're going to have to go above and beyond the call of duty. It's not just a sales job. This is also going to be in some form a marketing job. So what I mean by that is you've got to understand how leads get generated, how to make it rain. Uh, and that means being really meticulous first about following up with anybody who has expressed interest. Um, an example would be, let's say your VCs do make an intro to somebody. You need to be jumping on that in minutes. Don't wait. Don't wait a day. Don't wait an hour. If you get an intro from a VC to someone in the network or in their portfolio, you jump on that in five or 10 minutes and follow right up and, and do that as quickly as possible and build in that model of excellence in your follow-up. Same with any kind of inbound leads. If your founders are paying for any kind of media campaigns and they're generating inbound leads, you need to jump on those leads as quickly as possible and start your follow-ups as soon as possible. So be meticulous there. That's a big part of, I think, demand gen is, is you know, nurturing those, building a process for follow-up and being consistent and, and thorough in following up with those leads. Um, here's a big one. And this, again, isn't just specific to any uh, startup AEs out there or early AEs, first in AEs. This is beneficial for really anybody in this business. And that's, you need to learn how to create your own materials. What I mean by that is create your own decks, learn how to create a kill sheet. That's, you know, a competitive side by side. So if you compete with, I don't know, XYZ SaaS vendor, you need to learn how to compare and contrast your solution with that vendor and outline that or, or visualize that in a slide or a Word doc or whatever that is to help your customers see how you're different than they are. So kill sheets, slide decks for presentations, proposals, um, action plans, what else? Uh, you know, account plans, all of the materials that you need to use both internally and externally that are client facing in an early startup, you're likely going to have to carry some of that lift. You likely don't have a brand marketer on the staff if you're, you know, employee number seven at a 10 person startup. And I've been in that seat and there was a marketer and uh, she was great, but she wasn't a, you know, brand marketer. She had a lot of skills there. Um, but you know, in a lot of these roles, you've got to figure out how to create your own materials. Uh, I've even, uh, worked on landing pages and there's a bunch of softwares out there that are, you know, super cheap that you can pitch to your founders on getting a, a landing page set up and you don't even have to know code. You don't have to know how to build a website. It's a drag and drop, you know, click to add a input box and a button that says, you know, submit, right? So building landing pages, building your, your slide decks, that's going to show your overview of the product, building your proposal deck. That's going to show the structuring of the pricing, um, building a demo environment, you know, learning quickly. The product is, is also really key and important here too, because again, in an early startup, you might not have an experienced product marketer on the staff who's going to be able to go into the product and, you know, tell the full story 
or visualize or map out the journey, you're going to have to be the one that, that picks up some of the slack there, or at least, you know, helps with some of the momentum there is, is probably a better way to put that. So come in, learn as much as you can about the product, sign up for a trial, get, get your founders to, to create an environment for you to practice in and learn how to demo that alongside the founders typically is how that works in an early company. So if your founders aren't helping with that process, then you need to demand that they help because it's, it's part of the success of the business is, is being able to, to demo the product and create those, those documents and, and, and those materials. So another uh, suggestion is to actually document and write out your value drivers. And I have a template for this. So if anyone listening to this is in an early startup and they don't know how to, to put together what their value drivers are in the business, send me an email uh, or shoot me a, a note on LinkedIn and I can send you a copy of this template that I've used now for several years. Uh, and basically value drivers are, you're, you're kind of defining what it is that you solve why you solve it and what the business outcome is for solving it, right? And I'm trying to just spitball some examples. It's really late at night right now uh, and it's been an, a terribly long day, so I don't have any off the top of my head. But if you want a copy of my template, I'm happy to share it. But it's, you know, it's basically just, here's what we solve for customers. Here's why it matters and why they should care. And here's the, you know, the business result that, that they might experience from this, you know, feature or function of this aspect of our product that, that creates a solution for our customers. So establish what those value drivers are, because the better that you have those defined and pinned down, the better you're going to be able to present those to the end prospects. And then the other thing, and I, I also have a template for this is document what potential objections might be from customers. What do you think they're going to say when they see your product? Are they going to say you're too small? You're not SOC 2 compliant? Are they going to say uh, you don't have customers that look like us? Are they going to say, you know, you're not big enough? You don't have, uh, you know, you don't have X, Y, Z, whatever those objections are, document those and then document how you're going to overcome those. And I've got a template that you can use also. Shoot me an email. Uh, let's see. Moving on really quickly here because I'm running out of time. But uh, you got to learn everything you can about who your ideal customer is. And this is going to involve you going in, talking to your founders, working with whoever it is they have doing marketing for the company at, that, at, at this point. Also, if they have anybody on the post-sale side. So if they've already made sales, there's likely in, in some cases even just an engineer who's implementing and fulfilling on the, the, the customer contracts, whether that's building out their environment and launching them. So talk to that person, interview that person and ask questions about what it is that, that customers are getting value from. And if you don't have any customers yet, ask the founders, what is it that, that you anticipate, uh, how is it that you anticipate customers are going to get value from this once we do have customers? Document it and you know put it in this same value drivers document. This kind of goes hand in hand with the value drivers. What is the value that a customer is going to get from your SaaS? Uh, and how do you document that? How do you present that to an end customer and be as thorough as you can. If you have existing customers, and again, in a lot of early companies, there's nothing, um, there's no customers, but, um, you know, if you have someone who's taken a chance on the business, see if you can interview that person and ask them why they, they selected your SaaS, uh, why they took a chance on an early startup and, and, you know, launched and figure out as much as you can about that. Learn your customer's lingo learn the implementation process so you can speak to that. That's going to be important as well. So just in, in kind of conclusion here, uh, some, some other suggestions here. I've got about two minutes, so I'm going to wrap this up really quickly. Uh, and yes, I'm, I'm on a timer. But, uh, you know, think out of the box. You're coming into a brand new business where no, likely none of your prospects know who you are. You don't have an established brand. So one of the things that I did in an early company, and I talked about this on an episode in the past, we created a Slack channel for our prospects and our customers to to interact and network with each other and work on you know mutually solving problems together and that was hugely successful for selling to the prospects in the community because i had access to them via slack it was really cool they could talk directly with our team of engineers as well so it built a lot of trust you need to be selling with the founders the founders need to be involved up to the first few million and then lastly is just create a lot of content set up a podcast, do a one pager, create a YouTube channel, start a TikTok channel, start writing LinkedIn posts, whatever it is, figure out where your buyers are, what platform they're on 
and create content on that platform. That's going to help you generate interest. When you're educating prospects, they want to buy from you. So if you can educate them through interesting and entertaining and informative content, you're going to be winning. So I hope that helps someone out there who's jumping into a first time AE role in a brand new SaaS company. Reach out if I can be a resource for you. I've, I've done it a few times over now. Love it. And I've learned more in these roles than I have in any other roles. And it's helped me even in the bigger company roles that I've been in. So thanks for listening and have a good night. 